how the, uh, the, bullet, uh, the uh, bullet of the assassin uh, political change occurs. They killed Anwar kind of Sadat, and yet the regime that came after him, Hussein Mubarak, is probably as vicious, if not more vicious, as the Muslims. They have served uh, American designs in the Middle East, and it's served, it's served the Israeli agenda as much as Anwar Sadat, if not more. So the point is, is how does one effectuate change in Islamic society? Uh, the way is to follow the way of the Prophet Muhammad. And so long as the overwhelming majority of the people are unaware of Islam, then our first task is education. Our first task is education. Uh, that does not uh, deny uh, other uh, tasks that must be taken, taken like uh, building social infrastructures, uh, like political participation when available to the Muslims, uh, like uh, the use of jihad and so forth when available to the Muslims. But the main thrust must be that of education because the Muslims, in reality, do not know what it means to be a Muslim. And so therefore that is our first uh, thrust. Um, as far as the way to uh, unity, I spoke about that in the lecture on Sunday uh, and I outlined uh, eight steps for Islamic unity. Okay, here's an Arabic uh, question uh, from the sisters. Um, says, um, Kaif al or how are the, how are the Ethiopians going to destroy the Kaaba? Um, uh, can you explain how, what the Prophet said in uh, the statement? Well, it's not the Ethiopians, it's that Ethiopian will destroy the Kaaba. And it, uh, the other hadith or <laughs> other interpretations mean that they'll be leading an army. All it means is that before the Day of Judgment, the Kaaba will be destroyed. This is a sign the Prophet told us. Um, uh, for some reason, uh, the Ethiopians will come and attack the Kaaba. I mean, obviously they're not Muslims who are doing it. I mean, whether they're idol worshippers, whether they're Christians, uh, they probably won't be Christians, but they'll probably be some sort of idol worshippers, uh, and they destroy it. They'll destroy it for some reason. And so therefore, this is the reality. But does that mean we just say, okay, well, this is going to happen, and eventually they're going to take over Mecca and destroy the Kaaba, and then we just leave, uh, you know, things in East Africa. We, no. We spread Islam there. We, we we make sure that there's only a strong Islamic state and that there's no pagan or Christian state there. He was fighting Qadr with Qadr. Um, as for how he will destroy it, he will, he will rip it apart um, stone by stone and he will take out the treasures of the Kaaba which are buried underneath the Kaaba. And um, uh, there are some other narrations which the um, authenticity are in question by some scholars but says that even after the destruction of the Kaaba, uh, the people will still make Hajj to the Kaaba. It won't be rebuilt. Uh, what will happen is Kaaba uh, will be destroyed and uh, an army will be sent of Muslims to fight the Ethiopians who have taken over Mecca and uh, will defeat them. These are not Muslim people. I mean, so when we say Ethiopians, I don't think of our brothers from Somalia and Ethiopia, which are Muslims. We're talking about non-Muslim people uh, in, in those lands. An army will be sent uh, to fight them and then thereafter a hike will be made to the Kaaba, but it will never be rebuilt. So we'll just remain a bunch of stones, you know, on top of one another. That's what it seems the hadith seem to uh, indicate. Even though this last hadith that I mentioned, uh, there's some difference of opinion concerning its authenticity, and that needs to be investigated. Uh, okay, this is a question which I'm told is a good question. Well, we'll see. How do we advise non-practicing Muslims as a result of their non-practicing is that their, their, their grandchildren will suddenly leave Islam? Uh, take them to any Islamic center, any masjid, on any day of the week when the Muslims are uh, 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 congregating, you know, Jama, Eid, when any time an event comes, okay? And show them. So you see these children? Are these Muslim children? Is this what happens? Uh, and everybody will see that. Everybody recognizes that. I don't think there's any Muslim who doesn't recognize that this is going to happen. But what happens is they don't want to face this reality. Uh, love of this world, uh, their hearts being just in growth, in gaining material things, has left them blind. Uh, so what you need to do is you need to prod them. All right? You don't need to become overbearing upon the people, you don't need to shout at them, but proud parting them, uh, and giving them some sort of moerifah, some sort of admonition. Uh, I remember uh, one time uh, I was giving a chutzah to aid, and I mentioned the thing of the children, and uh, one of the incidents that happened, a uh, uh, father immediately came with his five children, and he was crying and so forth after the aid and said, oh, make your ass for them so that they don't fall into uh, these calamities. Uh, he thinks that, for instance, is a sheikh, even though I'm not a sheikh, but if the sheikh makes the ah, then therefore the sheikh barakah will preserve these children and so forth. So I tell them that this matter is not like that. Uh, the matter is that you have to uh, instill into your children Islam. Uh, don't make sure your children only come during any prayer, you know what I'm saying? This is not Islam and grow them. So this is a type of admonition, shalai ta'ala, would be useful. All right.
Uh, maybe it would be beneficial to remind the brothers and sisters who may think that the plot of the Kufar is too great or formidable uh, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, or, uh, Wallahu a'ala bin Okay? Yes, yeah, that's true. I wish you understand that we sh- this ummah is not an ummah of despair. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu gharibun ala amriki, walakin akhtar al-nasi la ya'lamun. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will prevail over his affair, and most of the people do not recognize that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, what he decrees is, and these fact that the kuffar are above us is not because that they will have victory, but this is a punishment from Allah to us because we're disobedient. Uh, but the point is, is that when this test comes, when this tribulation comes, when this punishment comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, those who fail this test go to the hellfire. I mean, for instance, when the, when the, when the Messiah the Jad comes, and confuses people, and people start thinking that he's a lost to the large portions of humanity who worship him. As those who are with him and die in his ranks will go to the hellfire because they believe that he is a lost. But those who recognize him to be the, a false, uh, a false in his claim, that he's the antichrist, the false uh, Christ, uh, they will succeed in the hereafter. Uh, so the point is, one should not think that the kuffar uh, are such and give them the attributes of a lost. Some, some Muslims uh, think that the kuffar, whatever they thought, the plan occurred. Whatever they uh, think of will happen. No, this is not true. They are not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are not Rabbul Alameen. They are from Allah's creatures. Indeed, they are so weak. And they are so uh, ignorant. And so powerless. But it's only because of our sin that they are able to be above us. At the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us the Quran, وَعَجْدُ لَهُمْ عَجْدُ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ Muster what you can of strength against them. So we need to have both things. We need to muster what we can of material strength and also we must be true Muslim because in the, day, in the end of the day it is our faith that makes us superior and not anything else. So we don't want to go to other extremes. One extreme is only by faith and could care less about the worldly uh, means and the other extreme is only by worldly means and does not care about faith. Alright, this seems to be another question. Uh, how can we defeat those who fight against Muslims internationally who are based in Europe and America that is the free nation? Uh, when they know so much about the Quran, we do not know about the strategy. Uh, brothers and sisters, look, uh, our job is not to worry now about the Freemasons uh, in America and Europe. Uh, this is something that only the Ummah uh, can face, uh, whether it's this political power or that political power. Uh, what we want to do is, how, what is our goal in Our first rule is that we must educate ourselves on Islam. I mean, the first rule is that each one of us must be a true Muslim. Uh, the next rule is that each one of us as it is the natural thing with most human beings, they get married and they have children, must develop a true Muslim family. Alright? And the third rule is that you must give da'wah to those who you come in contact with, whether your family members, whether your neighbors, and so forth. And then if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a skill, uh, gives you something by which you can benefit your ummah with, whether it is knowledge, like medicine, or science, or engineering, or political uh, science, or, or economic uh, science, and you therefore use this to benefit the ummah, or whether it's knowledge of the religion, I mean, whatever skill that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you, you then use these skills that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you for the benefit of the Ummah. So, we want to have a realistic approach. We don't want to be uh, caught up in a lot of emotionalism and so forth. Each one of us should see himself and herself as having a role in this Ummah. We should not just be going day by day, you know, and just lost, you know, in the thoughts that they say. Uh, uh, not really understanding what's going on, sort of not even understanding our religion, uh, all really like comes in, and then what will happen is at the end of the day, the most important thing to be to you is how to kill yourself. That will become the important thing at the end of the day. So we need to be uh, true men and true women, true Muslims, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will change our affairs for us. Uh, but we start with ourselves, okay? And, and the same thing which I want to mention, which is, look, a person is where he puts himself at. Uh, you know, people have that issue. Right. You want to be a doctor, you put the hours necessary to study to be a doctor, right? This is your ambition in life. Uh, so likewise, we should have ambitions in our ummah, okay? I want to be uh, beneficial to my ummah. I want to how to help my ummah. You should have that type of ambition. And then you should take the proper steps in order to fulfill that ambition. But if each one of us sees that he has no role, he has no importance, he sees of himself as a nothing, she sees of herself as a nothing, then, I mean, you'll end up as nothing, you know? But if you feel yourself having a role and you take the proper steps by first building your faith and your religion and your family and so forth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide you and direct you to what is right and you will be a benefit for
for this Ummah instead of being dead weight for this Ummah. How do we build up the Muslim community? Uh, again, as I've repeated many times, uh, we build up the Muslim community by building ourselves first, by building our families, and the next thing, by building institutions. Alright? I mean, what brothers should have, especially those brothers who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put them in charge of something. Okay? In charge of a mosque, in charge of a, a study circle, in charge of an Islamic society. You should be able to sit together and plan. How are you going to now, for instance, this university, or, or, or what's it called here? South Bank. Okay, how are we going to, in this university, uh, spread your class this year? Alright, it's already the month of March, so maybe we only have a couple of months of this academic year. Okay, but what about next year, when the new academic year starts? How are we going to spread that way? Alright, how many Muslims are studying in this university? Thousand, two thousand, okay, how many, uh huh? Oh, uh, well, hold on, we don't even know how many Muslims are studying in this university, okay. Uh, then how, how many are going to actually pray? Uh, how many sisters do not wear the hijab? Uh, how many brothers and sisters are engaging in illicit sex? How many brothers and sisters are taking drugs? I mean, how are we going to spread down with them? I mean, it doesn't come just by saying, okay, we're going to have a circle and put a couple of posters on the wall and so forth. That, that's not, that's not down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is planning. Down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is thinking. We need to get together and say, okay, how can we convey Islam to our fellow Muslims? How can we strengthen a Muslim's faith? A brother who's on the, or sister who's on the borderline. Uh, being pulled in this direction, being pulled in that direction. How do we strengthen them? What type of services can we provide for them? And likewise, how can we then spread Islam to the non-Muslim community? How can we dispel some of the misnotions they have about Islam? How can we make them understand that we have a presence in this university and we should be given our right to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to observe our prayers, to observe Eid, to have halal food on campus? How can this be done? This doesn't come just by sitting and talking. It doesn't come just by uh, you know, making uh, classes and so forth. It comes by planning for da'wah. It comes by brothers coming together, not with the desire that each one of them becomes the chief, and that therefore you have ten chiefs and no Indians, but rather it comes with, you know, the, the idea of saying, okay, we're going to follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us. وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالْتَقْوَى وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْجِسْمِ وَالْعِزْوَانِ That we unite together upon uh, righteousness and piety. We do not come together and assist one another upon sinfulness and aggression upon one another. So when Muslims, you know, have the correct belief, and when Muslims understand what is the task in front of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assist them in figuring out. And I think most of the solutions, each one of us knows them, but it's just a question of putting them into uh, practicality. Hmm? Okay. Uh, these will be the last uh, uh, two questions because I have another engagement that I have to go to. And I apologize for cutting it short. Uh, what will happen uh, to brutal Muslims like Idi Amin? Uh, do you think he did the right thing to non-Muslims in Uganda? Um, I don't know exactly what Idi Amin did. And I remember that when I was in Medina uh, some eight or nine years ago, uh, I was speaking to a Muslim from Uganda who said that many of the reports were just fabrications and so forth made by Christian missionaries and they really changed the story. So what Idi Amin did and what exactly happened to Uganda, I do not know uh, and I really don't have much information. All I know is what most of you have heard, that he was supposedly a brutal dictator who slaughtered thousands of people. Uh, if a person was a brutal dictator who slaughtered thousands of people, then obviously this is something which is not good. If God does not allow us to take life when it's not permitted to take it. I mean, even if it's a non-believer's life. We are a religion where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Quran that whoever gives life to a single soul is like he has given life to all the earth. Uh, and likewise, that whoever takes a single soul uh, unjustly, the cause of corruption of the earth is like he's killed all of humanity. This is what we're told in the Quran. So therefore, uh, the loss of human beings without justified uh, means and so forth, killing, just killing for just the sake of killing, or for racial reasons, or even if it's for out of religious reasons, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not thank you for taking the life, Allah hates you. And Allah will punish the people who do this, even if they're Muslims, okay? Uh, with that in mind, uh, we should know one thing which is certain, that the Christians were able to use the issue of Idi Amin for their agenda, in Central Africa and East Africa. And the problems of Muslims now face in Uganda uh, at the hands of these Christians, uh, Christians who are uh, who are being bombed by the missionaries and are continuing to kill the Muslims, uh, is something which is uh, brings much sadness uh, to every Muslim who's aware of that situation. Uh, many people think there's a quick solution to the Muslim homeless problem. I think we should, exa for example, use politics to correct our problems. Uh, this is not the best way, is it? No, there's no quick solution to the Muslim's, Muslim's problems because our problems didn't occur overnight. I mean, it's not like, for instance, you know, all of a sudden, the Ummah, everything was doing well, 
People went to sleep after six o'clock on Isha, woke up for Sarva Sajjah, and oh, lo and behold, everything is uh, a mess. This didn't happen. This thing occurred after centuries of decay. And these centuries of decay are not just restricted uh, to matters of belief, to matters of policy, to matters of conduct and morality, uh, to matters of worship, uh, to matters of uh, ecology, to matters of uh, economics. The bunch covers to all the different uh, endeavors of human beings. Everything which makes uh, is part of life. Because as we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Quran, the Prophet of today, put in the Salati, with the Sufi, with the Hiyaya, with the Masi, with the Zahir of the Say that my prayer, my fasting, my life, and my gift of Allah, uh, uh, alone, the Lord of the world, who has no uh, partner, I, that I was commanded, and I am uh, not from, I'm from the first of the uh, So therefore, the whole uh, life is put before Islam. Uh, political reform is a solution, but it's not the solution for the Ummah. Uh, educational reform is a solution. But it's not the solution in itself for the Ummah. Economic reform is a solution, but it's not the only solution for the Ummah. Uh, moral, moral reform is a solution, but it's not the solution for the Ummah. Military reform is a solution, but it's not the only solution uh, for the Ummah. We need to completely reform the Ummah in all aspects. But the most important thing, without doubt, which we should have no doubt in our heart, is that we define what a Muslim is from not being a Muslim. In other words, our faith, our aqidah. Because uh, an ummah which has uh, a strong political and just political system, but doesn't believe in Allah's religion, is a worthless ummah. Because it will go to the hellfire. Uh, likewise, an ummah which has a strong economy, but doesn't believe in Allah's religion, will also go to the hellfire. And likewise, an ummah which has a strong military, uh, which doesn't believe in Allah, and can religion, and kufr, and so forth, will go to the hellfire. Uh, so therefore, uh, when, if we're forced to choose aqidah, comes first. But what I'm trying to say to you is that there's no, there's no, there's no reason why this has to be the only choice. In other words, the reform must be complete, and it must be broad-based, but it must be start with also with the education and so forth. Okay, this will be the final question. Is it true that the Dijal is alive today? The scholars have different concerning this, uh, based upon uh, the different reports of the Prophet Sallallahu and those who argue that he is alive today, based upon the Hadith reported by Tamim al uh, that he came across the Dijal while he was a Christian on an island chain uh, in uh, the sea and then uh, the Dijal uh, told him about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so he came to Medina and took his Shahada this is the ma ma major argument for those who say that Dijal is still alive today because the Tamim al saw him during the age of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and there are others who based upon other hadith uh, say that he's not alive today he gets reborn and they interpret this hadith in a different type of interpretation and it's a very lengthy, uh, long discussion uh, that would take much more time than we have uh, to complete. Uh, so I just, with that summary, I hope uh, I suffice the questioner. And um, I thank the brothers and sisters for patiently listening to me. And thank you all for your questions and your comments. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika, shalom la ilaha illa anta, astaghfirullah wa tubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.